in terms of the objective reasonableness standard that we enjoy here in the United States that defines self-defense and uh, and the lawful use of lethal force for law enforcement, a, a reasonable and prudent person in your condition, meaning ranger panties and no earplugs in, uh, <laughs> And a brown T-shirt would deduce that the four heavy machine guns hammering the shit out of your your hooch for the evening are in fact bad guys. He just he just did the sniper hat turnaround thing. The sniper turnaround. That's cool, bro. Um, like 1976 TV show called. They want their bullshit back. <laughs> <laughs> it's it makes me more accurate, and my chair is going to break halfway through the podcast. So it cuts the Coriolis effect. I'm going to turn Steve down. Everybody hear each other okay? Yeah, I'm, I'm good. You're good? Yeah, I get I it. Right. Good. I'll yep. just talk really low. Sweet. All right. All right. Welcome to the Big Tech's podcast, everybody. Today, we're out here at Shooter Symposium out Ranch, Texas. There you go. It's a yearly shooting event out here. There's eight or nine instructors on the bill, uh, I believe, this year. Ten. Training everything from night fighting courses Medical. Pistol, medical, you name it, it's going on out here. Uh, this is the f- fourth fifth? year. Fourth fifth? or fifth yeah. year? Fifth year? Yeah. You know fifth how I know year? that? You've been here for everyone. Well, that too. But I, <laughs> I, I won 20 bucks off Andrew from Surefire yesterday because we were doing the interview thing. He's like, so what year is this? I'm like, it's, it's the fifth. He's like, no, no, it's going to be the fourth. I said, what, what's the bet? He's like, 20 bucks. It's the fifth. It was nice. Excellent. This is the fourth year I've been out here. I should have ah. went for batteries. <laughs> yeah, give me like 1,200 give, give me a 1,200 pack of batteries. <laughs> you don't talk about that. And today we are joined by Chuck Pressburg and Steve Fisher. This will probably be the last one you guys ever get to air. <laughs> <laughs> Here's a good run. It's going to be hard to top it. That's for sure. <laughs> that's for sure. So we were, we were sitting out here talking about zeros and lasers and all that cool stuff but before we get into the meat and potatoes let's do a real quick background so our listeners that might not be familiar with you uh we'll start with steve yeah it's uh you know about a 20-year run industry guy consultant trainer you know hands-on product development guy for years with various companies and that's just what it is now you know uh, besides the full-time training it's the hands and everything else that goes on behind the scenes. Guns, optics, you name it. Ooh. Currently one of the team shooters for uh, Sons of Liberty. So that's pretty awesome. And they've got a good presence out here. We were yeah. just talking to yeah. Kyle. Kyle was just over here. He'll yeah. be hopefully jumping on a show here this weekend as well. I'm trying to get him to do an energy drink that's all bourbon. <laughs> it's all bourbon. <laughs> so it's going to be great. It's, that, that's, it's just bourbon bourbon it's just, that's, that's just, just bourbon. It's just bourbon and Adderall, bro. It'll be fine. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Somebody, we'll, we'll have to wait till we patent that before we release this episode. Oh, <laughs> Chuck, a little bit about yourself. Uh, 26 and a half year Army guy, uh, Ranger and stuff. Um, got out five and a half years ago and uh, was doing some training bef- before I got out, but like, you know, kind of hit it full time in in 2018 hard. And uh, like like fish, do a lot of consulting and uh, product development, business development in the in the background. Currently a brand ambassador for B Myers, and I'm on the pro staff for Sons of Liberty as well. Uh, and, and I'm a consultant for Blue Force Gear also. So kind of found some strategic partners that didn't didn't cross the streams, and uh, you know, providing my end user kind of feedback on on the man machine interface human factors engineering on product design and and things like that so it's kind of like ghostbusters you don't cross <laughs> yeah you don't cross never streams. cross streams don't cross <laughs> streams. that would be bad egon mm. <laughs> that would be bad you're you're teaching a night fighter specific course out here or night time specific uh I'm, uh, yeah i'm partnered up with jamie caldwell from one minute out you know this year is all about the instructors coming together uh, that was one of the things that this symposium continues to evolve because the uh, every person that that signs up here they do an end of course critique they they rate classes what they like to see what could be better and they wanted to see more of the kind of mutt and jeff instructors playing off of each other uh dynamic out, out here so um 
So Jamie and I, who had been previously teaching night vision classes separate at previous symposiums, were now paired up to teach uh, night vision together this this weekend, and then I'll be doing two day blocks. I'll be doing intermediate handgun with Dan Brokos from Lead Fawcett, and then uh, the fan favorite, myself and SWAT man, uh, <laughs> Musclehead Bill Blowers, <laughs> will be together on, on Sunday, uh, as, as I like to call them, Blyceps. Uh, <laughs> me, me and Blyceps will be uh, be out uh, burning it down on Sunday. So, yeah. And, awesome. and, and what are you teaching? Out here this time. Oh, what am I doing this time? Uh, so I've got red dot pistol tomorrow, red dot handgun, whatever you want to call it this week. Red dot thing, he's on top of pistols. You know, it's still new for the past 20 years. And then um, shooting on the move blocks, one handgun, one carbine. Awesome. That's be a good time. Yeah. Sounds like it. So now to your question. Yeah, so I guess we were sitting over there on the couch, y'all. We're talking about um, converging zeros mm -hmm. with night vision and... And the ins and outs of it and i'm going to lead into it because it was a, a very good point that you made in that conversation about army ncos not knowing what's going on outside of the gun and ballistics and i'm sitting over there laughing to myself as you're saying that because prior army nco you know regular force mechanized infantry so it was like here's your laser put it on your gun all right, let's go. Like literally, because they didn't care, because it was the 35 ton Bradley that they cared about, not yep. us. And so when you said that, that was exactly. I was like, uh, I could sit here and listen to him talk about lasers and zeros. Oh, and I could, I can, I can rage. I can rage <laughs> on some, uh, some army. Can you, would you like to rage some? I mean, Don't rage. let's say there's a let's say there's a quarter of a million Pac-15s in, in the United States Army today. Two hundred and forty thousand are not zeroed. Yeah, um, that that's the reality. Like we can clown on the, we can clown on the Russians right now, but if I challenged the chief of staff to go to any maneuver brigade combat team in the entire United States Army today and do a no notice call out, draw your weapon, go to this range shoot and hit that piece of steel in the C-zone or better at 100 meters, I would guarantee you that we would have a 90-plus percent first-round fail. Oh, yeah. um, part of that is cyclical. Some units don't have that hair string, hair trigger. I was always in a unit where I was deployable, like no notice. And so unzeroed weapons were vile. Um, and during our alert sequence, there was time programmed in to, to make that happen. But the other part of it is the, the lack of understanding about external ballistics just in general. So even when you are there, non-commissioned officers don't understand uh, how to diagnose what their soldiers are doing, how to uh, get the appropriate effects they want. If they're dealing with some type of reduced range zero, how does that transfer over to a longer range zero? And uh, it, I've just watched this process over three decades of the evolution. You know, when we came in the Army, you had an M16, and they had a 25-meter point of aim, point of impact, zero on that piece of paper. And that meant to the exact same impact at 300. But there was a range drum, and you had to move it one click at 25 to compensate for that height over bore, and then you clicked it back, and that was your actual deal. And then when we got the aim point, uh, I'm like, where's my click? They're like, ah, there's no click. 25 meters, point of aim, point of impact. I'm like, this is the same gun, same bullet, same range, bro. <laughs> like, how come, why come did my iron sight have to get clicked? And then when you gave me an M4, I had to click twice. You even put a little Z on the side, a little Zulu <laughs> there for zero. Made that shit idiot proof so the NCO couldn't even forget how many clicks to go. You just turn the drum to the Z, and then when you got done zero and you turn it back for, for field fire, like I'm looking I'm looking at the clicky mount on the aim point. I'm like, ain't no Z on this bitch. <laughs> like, what, what are we doing here? And, uh, and sure enough, we needed an offset zero target. Aim here. Bullets should land in this other circle below it over here. And that replicates true line of flight to, to 300. And uh, I, I learned my aim point zero from, because I was carry handle. We, we had fixed carry handle. So I've got this Weaver aluminum 
chunk on top of my carry handle with an aim point with bb gun scope rings or whatever <laughs> on that shit and then there's t- you know some double flex cuff and some 100 mile an hour tape and a thumb screw it's a 550 cord and uh right and which of course would not fit in a weapons rack so i had to take it off as soon as i got got done with the range and i was screwed until the next time i could get to a range um and the only place that we had that had kd capability was camp lejeune there was no, the in mechanized there was, there was no sniper yeah. kd range there was 300 meter pop-up ivan so you're shooting minute of ivan at 300 uh so i had no way to assess zero capability walk back printing like any of that so i would go to lejeune we would do a marksmanship deal up there about once a year and now we could split the platoon in half put half the dudes in the butts raising the gigantic targets that you see in you know full metal jacket or whatever and then i could dial clicks until my aim point actually hit so true 300 point of aim point of impact and then it's like well you're not going to get back here for a year so i would go to the 25 meter range slap a target up there shoot and then i literally would cut out that target that had where i was aiming and where the bullets printed and i laminated it and kept it in the suspension system of my k-pot with my picture of my girlfriend and her panties or whatever i had up in their k-pot <laughs> with it at that time i think it was vs 17 panel uh, a, a used thong a picture of my girl and and my uh my zero um and so when next time we went to the 25 meter range i'd pull out my card and i'd adjust it to where the shot group of the thing and that was the only way and that was the first time that i saw an offset an offset target the the entire concept of it like we just guys couldn't even wrap their head around what was going on uh with the external ballistics of these weapon systems and this height over bore of like, yeah, man, if you force the angle of attack on a four-inch height over bore to make that that gun mortar that high that it's going to cross over line of sight at 25 meters, like, your max ord is redonkulous. Like, it, it's redonkulous. 15 inches. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. You, like, you, you know, you hold on a guy's, you know, uh, upper chest at, like, 125, and you're straight smoking. I mean, all, all the way over the top of that guy's yeah. head. And you're not getting any... Uh, dirt kick up behind him or whatever and you're just like i don't understand and that that's the army i zero at 25 the way you told me whether it's right or wrong and then i go out and these ivans aren't falling down and i don't know if it's shitty range maintenance and those targets are full <laughs> of holes whether that pop-up target's even broken or whether my zero is you know incompetent because I, I just don't know where the i don't know where my external ballistics are at that moment and you take all of that, and that's during the daytime where human beings are designed and geared to operate, and then turn out all the lights and take the emitter and throw in a horizontal offset in addition to a vertical offset, and it turns into fucking clown show. Uh, and our first laser pointers had no visible laser to co-align, so you couldn't even start the zeroing process until the sun went down. And even w- even in a, a Ranger battalion, like as soon as we could identify IR lasers on paper with the daylight covers on our nods, we were starting the zero process. And at 2.30 in the morning, it would be a platoon sergeant, a squad leader, a team leader, and a private. And the former three are all standing in a semicircle around the latter three and every or the latter guy and everybody else is asleep and they were out there zeroing one more guy that guy and and it's it's non-stop effort from from sunset until 3 a.m to to get every member of the platoon's laser zeroed only to be stripped off the weapons as soon as they got turned in anyway and uh, it's it's only been in the last 10 years to 15 years that we've unfucked the uh, physical security requirements and, and recreated lockable cages because the double lock, the double lock and alarmed is not going to go away. That's that's the army army policy for protecting machine guns and nods. So. So, OK, so how do you put a rifle behind two locks? without these arms that are cut out to specific slick down rigid things and it ends up you need cages you need cages with hooks you can hang the guns and they can kind of free hang by their front sight post or by a sling swivel or whatever and then they've got a four inches of circumference around until they bump into another one of the rifles so it looks like beef hanging in a freezer 
Like that's how rifles should hang inside of a closed lockable cage now so that the shape of the weapon system is agnostic to, to whatever's going on. So as it pertains to the, the converging versus parallel zero, um, I taught parallel and uh, because it's ballistically superior. And then I taught uh, Blowers. He contracted me to, to teach his agency early on when he was still uh, a cop. And then he, he came back and gave me some feedback, and he was like, dude, m my guys cannot wrap their head around uh, Parallel Zero. And I was like, how bad was it? And he goes, well, you know, we have 16 hours of in-service training a month to do SWAT skills, and I pissed away 25% of it four hours zeroing my SWAT team. He goes, I cannot use four of my 16 hours a month to get this perfectly refined zero that's going to allow me to shoot out at distances way, way, way beyond the distance that I could legally justify shooting somebody in America. And so he, he, he asked me to check on the math. And he's like, Chuck, so if the, let's say the, the offset is an inch and a half to the side, and I converge that at 50, the rules of geometry say that it would take another 50 for that laser to get an inch and a half away from the bullet in the other direction. And I'm like, uh-huh. He said, so at 100, my gun's only an inch and a half off. And I'm like, uh-huh. And he's like, none of my guys are holding an inch and a half group at 100 with their gun <laughs> anyway. Yeah. And then he's like, and then, and so then at, 150, it's only three inches off. And I'm like, uh-huh. And at 200, it's only four and a half inches off. And I'm like, uh-huh. So if I broke a shot totally straight center on a guy, I would still hit him in one of the lungs. And I'm like, uh-huh. It's like, I'm never parallel zeroing again, dude. Like, <laughs> the, the, the juice isn't worth the squeeze. I'm going to use a zero where I can tell these guys, just spin the knobs upy downy, lefty righty until – wherever the laser is pointy the bullets are impacting and then call it good like it allows you to train to the lowest common denominator of guy and he goes the the ballistic advantage of zeroing this thing to parallel just doesn't 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 line up you know i, th so. I think one of the good things to that though too is like for le guys it's a quick easy confirmation that the laser hasn't been bumped bang losses zero whatever it is like it's a fast down and dirty easy like co-witness check for them so to speak like when we used to run your co-witness sight guns right you're like okay my dots here my even though we knew that was wrong so to speak because lenses parallax weird stuff dialies eyes it was, it was all crazy but it's a really it's a good thing that we've kind of seen it now because it's, it's it's quick it's easy for the department guys get on the gun get on the laser or they're d-ball whatever something is lost zero they get it back they throw it on the gun it's click 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 click, and they're, they're done and they're right there and it's you know a couple shots to refine you know a few clicks either way it makes it easy especially from the training time frame standpoint for us because you only get a few hours yep. yep you know eight to 16 hour you know you're running an eight hour day with guys two yeah. three days and then you're like oh, here we go <laughs> and that's why i don't argue about can uh, i don't argue about um, converging versus parallel anymore, unless you're a DOD guy. If you're a DOD guy, you need to have your laser parallel. But I will argue the distance at which you converge because you have to understand the concept of you're doubling whatever the laser offset is uh, from your bore. Um, you're adding that every, every time you do the distance. So if you converge at 25... Now you're an inch and a half left at 50 and three inches at 75, four and a half at 100. So the same math that Blower should just given me, four and a half inches at 200 by converging at 25 instead of converging at 50, you have the same round deviation 100 meters closer to you than you had in, in the second argument. Um, so you're eight inches so, off at 200. Or not I have, yeah. Yeah. Yep. And so make your angle of attack as gradual as possible. And so that's why you can't be any further away than your parallel because then you're never going to converge. You're divergent at the muzzle, and that's just as bad, if not worse. <laughs> um, so when you put your target down, 
draw like a line where your laser offset uh, is you know take a ruler and say all right my, my according to the manual I am one and seven eighths inches offset so you make a line there and then anywhere between the center of your bull and that line is an acceptable beaten zone in my opinion uh, for shock group so um, you know oh look I, I zeroed converging air quotes at 50 but all of my rounds are still to the left. That means you haven't yet converged. You're close, but you might be converging at 75 with that group that you see that's on that's just a little bit off to the side. So now we play the doubling game. Now it takes another whole 75 yards to get a, every 1.5 inches off, offset after that. So, you know, if you could converge at 100, it, you're essentially parallel within the operational, you know, effective range of... of uh, of you know, an M4, yeah. you're, you're fine. Uh, the problem is aiming at the same place at 100 is hard. So you'd have to learn cheats like hog saddle. Um, you know, the thing about a laser is that you don't have to be behind the gun. I could put a rifle in a, in a sandbag or in a hog saddle. I could get a, a loopy spotting scope, come out of it like to like 12X and literally look into the thing with my nods. And I could point the laser to the center of a target an actual hundred without ever even looking over the gun or, yeah. or whatever i've seen guys i saw a dude um shoot a six or eight inch group at a thousand meters with an m24 sniper rifle with a thermal weapon sight on it and the thermal weapon sight had this push in eye cup and it was like all uncomfortable you had to crane your neck and it was really really bad and we were testing out the mill reticle for the past 13 weapon site for the for the army and this dude was an sf sniper out of uh out of oki and uh we had a plug-in video out and the scientists were watching it on a six inch screen and this sniper is just really starting to get pissed off with this body position and he finally sat up and he turns to the nerd and he's like give me that tv and he snatched <laughs> the screen from him and he sandbagged in the m24 and set up the six inch screen and he sat fully upright and fired that remington 700 police while looking at a six inch tv screen and having his neck in a very neutral comfortable position and and he's shooting at a thermal type e silhouette at a thousand meters and uh, we're in this like uh it was an aberdeen proving grounds it had like these walls so it was totally climate controlled it was outdoor but there was no crosswind it completely blocked all w external ballistic wind effect and he just stacked them and i'm watching i'm like wow like that sub MOA out of an M24, which is a MOA-ish sniper rifle anyway, and he's got this clunky ass thermal weapon sight that was never made to be put on a sniper rifle that we were retrofitting to put on a sniper rifle, and he crushed it. And that's when I realized, like, that's the beauty of not having to be behind the gun. You can, if being behind the gun makes you uncomfortable or makes you see worse, you do you. Yeah, zeroing is an administrative event, man, you know? So that's a tough one to top. You can't yeah, even right, have another yeah. story after that. I'm like, I'm like, hey, hey man, just cut at this point. Here? Like, where do you go from here? It's like, wow, it's like, so I know where we go. Can you build a range like that? I can you add that to your range. <laughs> We've got it at 100. We've got it at 100. No, that's good enough. One at tenth of the way there. Close. Yeah, it is. Jeez. Hang on one second here. I got to give somebody their pass, their hall pass. Oh. I'll link up with you when we're done, Jimmy. Thanks, Jimmy. Great job. Good job, Jimmy. <laughs> Whoever Jimmy is. Yep. The goon life just just, just part of the building. Yeah, just, he's in here. Wait, wait oh, for the camera, Jimmy. That one. <laughs> Jimmy. What's up, Jimmy? Good to see you again, buddy. How are you, man? Hey, get out of our podcast, Jimmy. <laughs> <laughs> you got your own YouTube. Yeah, get out of here. <laughs> That's so, crazy. So technology is always changing and advancing just like you were talking about sitting back and and looking at that seven inch screen and, and hitting targets at a thousand meters with a with a thermal site when you're working with s civilians now both of y'all and you're seeing everybody come in on the line and there's 15 different lasers on the line how much does that impact what you're teaching on i mean i i'm assuming that it's much easier to do the converging zero when you've got 15 different laser setups on. Oh, of course. Yeah, 100%. 
And it's like, is it the hill you're willing to die on? And there are some times where I'm like, yes, because I'm trying to teach a lesson here. And we, we're not going to cut corners. Um, but POI time is finite. Just mu much like Bill Blower's 16 hours of in-service training, I have 20 hours to impart everything. Do I want to spend four hours of zero attempting to achieve parallel? And that's why uh, I'm used to this, the, using this term dirty converging. If your rounds land at the parallel zero mark, great. If they land in the center of the X, great. Anywhere between the two, great. It's only to the right of that X or to the left of your parallel point that we need to bring you back into reality. But when you give yourself that kind of leeway in there um, to where it doesn't need to be perfect, you know, parallel zero is an Easter egg hunt. If there are 180 clicks of windage, that's an arbitrary number, uh, on a PEC-15 or LA-5 laser, 179 of them bitches are wrong. And you are out there in the dark trying to find the click that is parallel. And, uh, and you wonder why it takes a long time. So, uh, you know, pro tip, if you can, zero at night by yourself or with just one buddy because you need the shoot, check, shoot, check, adjust, check, adjust, check. And when you add people with the unload, make safe, or put them on safe, let them hang, let's walk down together as a group. Uh, now guys are pulling off their boots to count on their toes on how many clicks they need, <laughs> like whatever. You could just see how, it, how you would get it done faster. Oh, yeah. You know, at my old work, I, I'd go out by myself with an ATV, and I'd – pull up one of those big, you know, Marine Corps huge target boards, put a piece of glint tape on it, and I'd shoot, jump on the ATV. I wouldn't even shut the ATV off. Drive down 100 meters, check it out, put the ATV in reverse, wouldn't even turn it around. Back up 100 <laughs> meters, get off of it, lay down, bam, fire another whatever, jump back on the ATV, down there, and I would just do that. And then when I was happy with 100, let's go back to 150, let's go back to 200, let's go back to 300. And so I could collect reams of data by myself that would have taken hours and hours and hours and hours to achieve in, in a group format. So if you have a place where you have the noise attenuation or you can shoot suppressed or you have your own home range or whatever, uh, collect your data in the most efficient manner you can. And for me, that's me and, and a buddy or me by myself. Um, but yeah, as soon as you get in a, a classroom, you just, you're adding time to the clock, just yeah. the efficiency of the line. Yeah, and, is, and then dudes rush, painful. right, because they feel that. Like, they feel that yep. pressure, like, oh, oh yeah. these guys are done, these guys are done, every shutter. Then, then it just goes to total horseshit yeah. anyway at that yep. point. And, and all it takes is lost. all it takes is one guy's major correction, spun the wrong Shh. direction, and now he's all the way off target board. And when that happens, I have to hold the entire lineup, go back forward to find this guy, mm -hmm. get him back on paper, and uh, n normally I can look through his optic if I have the ability to co-witness or see his, see his reticle, and I'll be able to see. If, it's, if he's off target board, the laser pointer to his day reticle are going to be so far that when I, put the, when I put his laser on target board and then look through his EOTech, because EOTech's <laughs> in between target 10 and target 11. Okay, buddy, the rounds we cannot account for <laughs> went where your day optic is, so Somewhere we need to bring here. you a major left correction. Well I, well, I went 15 clicks, you know, left on the right on the last one. And I'm like, want to bet on that? Like, <laughs> we want to bet on that? Wait, was that on the EOTech or the laser? So, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, the, the generally, like, if out here for this weekend and the, and the short time format, Jamie and I have already talked about it. Like, if they're, if they're in the black on a B8, like, we're okay. Like, this isn't. We would rather talk about some of the other aspects of, of shooting at night. So we just have to make sure that the gun is generally aligned within the accuracy standards that we're going to ask right. for a flat range. Um, because it's not the intent. Uh, but for normally for a night vision class, guys want to come there and they want to leave the course with a very refined zero on their gun or whatever. So it's a, it's a balancing act. It's, it's a big common denominator, right? Like no matter what it is, it's got to have an absolute zero. You know, I don't care if it's your your primary optic, your offset red dot, plus your laser, plus whatever else you've, you've screwed onto the gun, iron sights, tertiary dots, whatever you have today, it's, it's got to be absolute, right? It's got to be within the means of the mechanical accuracy of the gun, the ammunition, and the shooter. Because if not, it's it's just it's nothing. You have nothing with the gun at that point. So it's all got to be right. Even if you had like 
let's say, experience calling wind or uh, holding high K- Kentucky windage in general. Um, there's a term that we use in land navigation, map and compass orienteering, and that is an azimuth and distance walked through the woods from an unknown point takes you to another unknown point. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you have to have a zeroed weapon it in order to hold, is, in order to hold right your there. damn sight over, over the target. That's a t-shirt. So, yeah. <laughs> That's a t-shirt right I there. I want to know about the, 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 the dirty converging. Do we have, is Duke working on that design yet? What, that, the that dirty converging? Oh, yeah, dirty, 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 dirty converging. That should be a that should You're, you're going to see that term on tactics and applications tomorrow? Yeah. yeah. It's going to be the new one? Yeah. As long as that T-shirt doesn't have pronouns on it, like like I don't want to hear dirty converging and some they them like that ain't, happening. That ain't we we don't roll like that on Brad press check. Um, so one one of the things that you you talked about was this the separation between LE and civilians and DOD and why you would can you can you touch on why you would focus on parallel zero for DOD for those people. Yeah, it it uh, it actually happened uh, in Afghanistan. Um, the fellows were in a walled compound that they had taken over for the night. The enemy saw at sunset that they are right there. They took over the castle, whatever. They brought up four uh, Dishka 12.7 millimeter heavy machine guns and put them on a, a little ridge line about 500 yards out. And it's like... Okay, you blind f- goat fucking people. Like, you, how are you going to aim? Well, they had a sh- set of shitty Russian nods, and they sent a sapper low crawling forward with these Russian nods handheld and a magazine of green tracer. And when he got close enough that he could visually make out the outline of the castle, he ripped off a mag of green tracer into the wall of the castle, and then instantly this ranger element was under fire from 450 cals at a distance of 500. And so everybody's individual rifle, as they rolled out of the bed or whatever and grabbed these rifles and threw their LA-5s on this far mountain, first off, let's get to the PID thing that's different. Well, they're the only Americans in the valley. Well, nobody shoots uh, green tracers except for... Uh, the Russian Warsaw Pact weapons. So in terms of the objective reasonableness standard that we enjoy here in the United States that defines self-defense and uh, and the lawful use of lethal force for law enforcement, a, a reasonable and prudent person in your condition, meaning Ranger panties and no earplugs in, uh, <laughs> And a brown T-shirt would deduce that the four heavy machine guns hammering the shit out of your your hooch for the evening are, in fact, bad guys. But I never thought I would shoot 500 meters at night. I can't even see a person at 500. I can't PID what they're wearing. Do they have a gun? I don't know. No, no. These are the fucking excuses that are given to me by Converging Zero people. And it's like sometimes... When you know, you just know. <laughs> and I can't necessarily paint that picture for you, but wouldn't you like to be able to whatever? Talk about University of Texas. Every one of them f- fucking dudes that showed up when Whitman is up in the tower going pew, 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 not a single one of those cops shooting whatever they were shooting thought they would ever be shooting that far away. And they were just hammering the shit out of the side of that building uh, with whatever guns they could find. And so if you have a weapon that is ballistically capable of this range, why are you cutting yourself short unless there's another downside? So in the Blowers conversation, when he explained it to me, he's like, like it or not, should they be able to do it? And they just can't wrap their heads around it. Like we can argue about, you know, whether they should understand ballistics better or not. But at the end of the day, four hours are gone. Yep. And so in that case looking at the chances of them going out on a rural manhunt, being engaged by the guy because he's got a hog hunting thermal, and now he's hit a cop, and they're returning fire at muzzle flashes. But even Blowers is like, I'm not sure I would shoot at a muzzle flash in America, you know, because it doesn't have green tracer. And so, so you know, shooting at muzzle flashes in the dark, you're like it doesn't get you necessarily over the objective of reasonableness standard. So that's why I'm saying it's different between DOD and, and civilian LE. It, it's about uh, operational area and engagement distance, not about 
legal or, or anything like that. So, so I just think there is more opportunity for a DOD guy to have to engage people with their individual weapon at distances much further than, than a guy domestically. So. Okay. Good answer. Yeah. <laughs> He hurts my head sometimes. Right? <laughs> just like, I'm like, what? So what distance was zero at? <laughs> we were talking, what was that? What was that are again? are that... we still with the aim point and the Boy Scout rings on top of a four inch? With bailing wire with and duct bailing tape? bailing wire. Yep. Yeah. Duct tape. Oh, so you mean we're back now? We're back to that with like Unity Fast Risers and everybody else. We're, we're back, back to, to carry, carry handle. handle red dot. Yeah. 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 So the same thing like 20 years ago, it just keeps coming back in the industry just in a different way. Rapidly yeah. approaching. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy talk. Everybody go out and buy an A2 gun. <laughs> carry handles are hot now. Carry, carry handles are hot, quad man. Quad are coming back. Yeah. Quad rails are going to be back. Nah, it's be even, awesome. Um, Stop it. You know you want a quad rail. I mean, we're hitting 20-year we're hitting year, 20 year Iraq invasion now. Global war on that terror. That is insane. <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> there there are people coming to class that weren't even born yet. I mean, let's, Holy, yeah. let, let, well, let's yeah. get real, man, when you think about it. Like, we, we've got dudes showing up to class. You're like, what? What? What thing? Oh, yeah. Wild. We're old. Where yeah. year were you born? Twenty. Wait. Seventy. Twenty. What? I was born. Twenty. It started. Seventy. Not not with a nineteen. Yeah. First of the twenty. He's like what? what? I know. It's like the nineteen eighties were how long ago? I now? remember <laughs> when I got my first private, and he said, "So when's your birthday?" He goes, nineteen eighty four, and I'm like. You weren't even alive when The Breakfast Club came out. <laughs> and for some reason, it, that was an impressionable timeline point in my life. Like, like you're either pre-Breakfast Club or post-Breakfast Club. You know? He's like, sir, I don't understand. My, my seven-year-old yesterday on the way back from school, she goes, Dad, do you remember in the 80s when the juice boxes, when, they, when people be, came up with juice? I was like, what? <laughs> people came up with juice in the 80s? It's just like, awesome that that was just invented. Like, I didn't realize that. I don't even know why you're talking about juice boxes <laughs> at school in the 80s, but yeah. Ask I your mom. She's actually. got a box of wine. It's the same thing now. <laughs> you, know, you know this generation is referring to the 90s as the late 19th century. Yeah. I'll stab a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> like, right now, talk of that crazy talk. They have no idea of the struggle. Uh, it's very real. But, it, I mean, it is coming back around, and it's coming back around in popularity. I mean, just, yeah, it, it's cool. That there's yeah. nothing new. We talked about this years ago on like several other podcasts. Like the only thing that is changing is the technology. That's it. That's it's still like how old is the M16 M4 platform, right? What has changed in it other than some metallurgy and a gas system? It's still essentially the same gun. Mm. I'm gonna be speaking at Eugene Stoner's 100th oh, birthday. Yeah, that's right. And. Uh, you know, <laughs> I, I, I have I have some I have some opinions and love for the AR platform. It's just one of the most efficient, ergonomic, just amazing, best things ever. But you hate it. So I will. Uh, <laughs> Eugene's descendants are going to be there. I'm just going to kind of look at them like, you know. Your dad was awesome. <laughs> like, what do you mean? <laughs> like, <laughs> like I, I, I really like this gun. Like, I really, really, really like this a gun. Lot. If the AR-15 is, is an option, it is always the answer. Um, nah. One, just one of the most efficient killing machines ever made by man. Ever. And it's hands still down. It's still the same. With a good zero, put in the right hands. Yeah. And if you don't have a good zero, just get closer. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's the whole thing with angular deviation. Yeah, like. So you're saying 36 zero is the way to go? Yeah, whatever. <laughs> whatever works, man, as long as you know. As, as long, long as there's you, a zero. As long as you know. Needs a zero. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you can get lucky. Every guy, like deer, every gun is every zero. guy in the deer woods gets lucky at least once, you know, with their rifle that they never zero in 20 years. It was bore sighted. It's close. With the uh, with the technology changing as it is and better, I mean, like the the LPVOs out, right? So the the stuff that we're seeing now is leaps and bounds over what we had five years ago. Look, two thousand five called. You know, Schmidt and Bender's got their short dot still, man. It's like mm. we, we saw that optic what oh four oh five. I remember you were still in. You took a a Pat Rogers class mm -hmm. with an LPVO and got top shot that's when at least the circles that i ran is when lpvos for sh shorter distances started becoming a thing or started becoming talked about it's definitely not something new but i know 
that's when people really started talking about it. I don't know if that was like 2016, 17, something around that. No, it was earlier than that. Way earlier. It was probably 13. Um, yeah, so, you know, when you test scopes, your scope subject matter experts are your precision people. Or in the military, it's your snipe people. Or in the SWAT team, it's your LE snipers, right? And so when we think about quality of a scope, what are we thinking about? Does it track true? Who the fuck even knows what does it track true mean? Nah, I know what it means. But is a click, is a click, is a click, right? Does the reticle, is it actually the right size? Uh, you know, does it retain its zero? Uh, how tactile are, are the clicks on the thing? These are things that precision people care about. But if the, the requirement for this low power, this variable powered optic um, is to replace uh, a CQB site and a magnifier, that means you're replacing a CQB site, uh, and, and, and you need to remember that. And so, therefore, um, if you give it to a sniper, they're going to pick something like the attacker 1 to 8. Like, it's very sniper-y uh, in, in what it does. The light transmission, the glass, the, the uh, you know, whatever. But in the first gen, the dot wasn't... Um, really as bright as it probably could have been, right? The new ones are a lot better. Uh, the iBox was not as open as some of the other competitors. And so when when uh, you're looking at the adoption of a, of a variable power optic that is not for a DM gun, that is not for a recce rifle, it is for a general purpose gun that might have to do um, close close quarters work, then it needs to be judged against that, especially if it's going to be like a patrol rifle. Because you talk like in an LE setting, 90, 90 plus percent of the time, it's being used like an aim point. Mm -hmm. And so it needs to do aim point stuff good. And that's why I took this scope to Pat Rogers' class, because uh, I knew it was a thousand round POI that was going to be shot uh, sub 50 yards. So I put the scope on 6X, I zeroed it. And then I put it on 1X, and I turned the dot on, and I shot the entire POI on 1X. And I ended up uh, squeaking out. Uh, Jared Reston's team leader was uh, was in the class. I ended up uh, squeaking out past him for top uh, top shooter in that deal. And he was running an 11.5-inch gun with a micro on it. And so at the end of that, like, I had this data. Like, mm -hmm. okay, I was able to keep up with EOTEX and aim points with this Vortex on 1X. Uh, and the dot was bright enough, and the field of view was good, good enough. Um, and other than, you know, some really wide transition stuff, you know, target to target transition stuff where the eye box was potentially getting compromised, I could do 90% of, uh, of what I could do with, uh, with that. So then it becomes an issue of, well, okay, so what are the downsides? Boat anchor, battery life, that's it. You, the, there ain't no auto shut off on these damn scopes. <laughs> if you don't go to the half setting and push that shit back in, when you come back, like you better bring some 2032s, like tape some 2032s all over your shit because you, <laughs> cause you know it's going to come back. As soon as you look at it, you see the tick mark next to a number, just shake your head and go, fuck. And at that point. Because you know. Yeah, you just know. Like you don't even need to look through it. Your, your, your shit's dead. Um, and so it's not something that you could turn on at the beginning of shift and go 10 8 with, you know, and run. You'd, you'd have to be comfortable enough uh, that you could shoot off crosshair uh, or that you're going to remember as part of that snatching the rifle out of the soft bag or grabbing it out of the rack, racking the gun, popping the sling and getting it over your body, and then doing that half turn and push it back in to turn it on while you're moving to, to, do, to do whatever. And there are some guys that are not willing to do that, and there are some guys that are. But the same argument can be made for... You know, the Huey or the EOTech is a yep. patrol optic. You know, the aim point's about the only one that you can just set it and forget it. Um, and it doesn't have some of the, the fancy capability that some of these other optics have, but that is that is where it's strong suit. doesn't have the field of view I like. It doesn't have the reticle I like. But damn if it doesn't have the weight and the battery life that I like. So, um, you know, no free lunch, man. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, it's funny talking about that, right? It's like I remember that course that he was in with that in that time frame. And then, uh, you know, we, we, I mean, when was the first time we really saw, you know, the variable power optics, right, really becoming popular? I think, like, fifth group was the first to field, like, the short dot, I think, at the time, around 05, I think, 06. 
and it was in a 193 mount that LaRue made to clear the LA5 PEC-15 lasers because obviously one PEC power. PEC-2. PEC-2. <laughs> Jeez. So and that's even like, worse. Yeah, guys have no idea that 193, I mean, such an obscure number. Yeah. Right? Like, why isn't it, you know, in quarters or tenths even? <laughs> and that was a back and forth with Mark LaRue where he was sending in the bear uh, aluminum, like overnight FedEx because he didn't have a PEC-2, and they were running the short dot over the field of view, passing it around the room. Is that good enough? Is that good enough? No, it needs to come down some more. And so Mark made like three or four different variants of his 1.5 SPR that was higher so that when they went down to 1.1 X, which was the bottom end on the uh, short dot, that it wasn't staring into the back of the laser and obscuring field of view. And 193 was the magic number. They and wanted it as low as possible, but they wanted it as low as possible that cleared the top of that laser when mounted at 12. And it just became the industry standard, even though like 10 we years don't later. use it. Yeah, yeah. We, don't <laughs> 10 years use, later, we don't use that night trail anymore. We don't yeah. use that laser <laughs> yeah. anymore. We don't use that scope anymore. But it was still On like an the arms, standard. You know, surreal, you know. you know, kind of thing, right, to do that. Like, but that's the thing, again. It, it all comes back around. This is something, you know, dudes are like, oh, I've got this 193 mount. It's great. It's just like, yeah, man, 2005. Call. Like, like this is old. Like, it is old technology. It, it's the only thing that is, again, catching up now is, is just that. It's all coming back around, and we're just getting better with certain components of it. It's crazy to think about it now. Mm -hmm. But now one seven's the hotness because, well, it's the correct head, you know, correct head position for most everything. Pick one, unless you have a laser up there. <laughs> It'd make it a lot easier to stock yeah. if there was just one one height. Yeah. <laughs> That's for freaking sure. Yeah, you don't have 12 SKUs. Oh. oh. Yeah. It, Ac according to my degenerating uh, neck and my VA physical um my, my my risers are now shrinking, much like the vertebrae <laughs> in my neck. Uh, I can't I can't hold a chin weld as long as I used to be able to hold it. Like the higher the the higher the mount, the better it is for standing up Pro with masks. with mask and and potentially with knots. Like okay, great. Yeah. But you know there are plenty of dudes that burn it down with EOTech, like right there on the on the pick rail. You know, I was a riser guy when I was at work, but I've shot. EOTech fl flush rail and yeah, it's fine. You're just training to mount the gun consistently, and and there's just less wiggle room in there. You know, if you've got a mask on or or, or what have you. But how many guys like have that job of mask? So if you're running a, a riser that's going to create other problems for you uh, because you're emulating a setup of a different guy that has a different job than you, like his setup yeah. might not might not be appropriate for you and uh yeah i'm uh I'm, my 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 variable powered scopes um you know my one to sixes and one to eights they're starting to go down to that same level that my prs sniper -y kind of scopes are at uh just because of my neck and and uh my, my age or whatever so i'm i'm much you know, I was in the 193 camp, then I was in the 17 camp, and now I'm fast approaching the 15 uh, camp. Um, just <laughs> coming yep. right back around, man. <laughs> around. Everybody comes back yep. around. It's uh, just consistency, consistency of stock. Well, you know, I, th I think a lot of it too. Like the big thing with the variable powered optics, and that came in, it came into play a lot harder. Was like, dudes are like, well, accuracy, 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 accuracy. Yeah, yeah, we got it right. We understand that, dudes really failed to understand how to set the optic up correctly to make best use of the 1X, right? They, they didn't understand that at all. Kyle DeFore put out some great stuff on that years back, and other dudes that have been shooting them. I mean, I can remember my first one was like 2007 era, 8 era uh, on some guns, but it's like, yeah, you've got to understand how to properly set the gun up, set the eye relief up, set everything up to make the most of that LPVO optic or whatever we're calling them these days. I don't even know the names anymore. What, what they are changes every, every other month. That's a big thing, but now... As dudes are getting older and the eyesight's changing, like, ah, I don't have a squiggle dot anymore or a comet, cupid, whatever, because of stigmatisms, whatever they've got going on. Oh, I can dial this ocular. Wow, I've got a clear dot. I've got a clear, everything is better at this point, right? So these guys that are getting more and more into it, like, oh, I can see again, right? And, and granted, 
you can get away with a red dot. We, we know this, right? Even with a bad stigmatism or that kind of a cupid, center of the dot squiggly thing is still center of the dot squiggly thing over the big center of whatever it is at that point. There's guys that just want better, you know, or, or it creates more eye strain on them because they're trying to focus harder on the dot instead of the target, right? So they're getting away from being target focused, threat focused, whatever, you know, we're calling it again. So now they're like, oh, this is causing too much eye strain, fatigue, and we see it. We see it a lot in courses. You just see guys squinting on the gun and they're getting down and really hard. Like, hey, man, you're trying too hard. Like, come off the gun for a minute or two. Just, just shake away the cobwebs. Let the eyes have a minute or two. Then get back on it. But then they're like, oh, can I try that rifle with that? Sure, hand them a gun. You know, just got, got a variable power. And they're like, oh, that's so much easier. Mm -hmm. like, yeah, it is. There, there's something to be said about being able to see. So that... that, that <clears throat> that's kind of one of the big things with it too in that transition i think that goes on and the le side obviously right we're seeing that with a lot of guys with i'm getting more positive identification i'm getting better information almost like forward observer shit until oh, yeah. the swat team gets there or like we just saw in a couple instances that have gone on the past few months literally i mean well hell phoenix just had the guy 183 yards with a dot gun you know took that dude on that one but then we saw was to come is that now that phoenix just had one too the guy in the middle of the street there was another one that phoenix just had too that was like 180 odd yards, like two months ago, I think it was. I know the Tacoma one too. That was another one. We'll have to look that other one back up. But then we saw the, the one Phoenix, one of the dudes shot the guy at 32 yards, rolled his one to six up to six power and brain box the dude on a quote unquote, you know, hostage shot when he had the kid. So right. yeah, that was options. 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 The, the, but there's trade offs to all of them. Could that dude have made the same shot with a 3X magnifier? Yeah, absolutely. But it is, it's just the trade offs and it's what you want. And that's the best part. And cost keeps on, well, I'm not going to say cost keeps going down, but because <laughs> everything's costing it more. Up. Yeah. It's, but it's, it's relative because you can get a really, really good glass, really good optic for five, six hundred. Yeah. So Cheaper. what are you paying for a good magnifier and, you know, aim point T1, T2 combo or comp M5 combo right. with a with three amount. or six yeah. X, you know, now, now you're well into the thousand dollar price point world. And then you're into mounts. Yep. So now you've got a set of Unity mounts with it, too, on top of it, or whoever else. Now you're like, oh, I could have got a 1 to 6 or 1 to 10 or 1 to 8 for the same price of all this. But I had the option of just taking that off and just running it as a red dot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, what's the right answer? It's nice to have good options It's now. great to have multiple guns with all kinds of things. It's like golf. You have a caddy, you pull out the bag, you're like, give me the GPR 18-inch gun with the 3 to 15. No, no, the other 3 to 15. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, now what we're seeing with that is, you know, everybody's coming back down to offset red dots on top of the guns. Well, welcome to 2009-ish again yep. when dudes were doing it on top of their original 2 to 10, you know, Night Force with a little MRDS up front in a tube ring. I had a uh, offset T1 and a Leopold... Um, Three and a half by fourteen or something, yeah. and that was that was that was awesome for two thousand eleven. Yeah, yeah. We're, you know? we're right back. See, you're a trendsetter. Then you were an influencer. You didn't even know it. Then <laughs> know it. You, you could have been on Instagram with her. Could have been cash and checks. Yeah, dude. Damn it, big money. I would have only got into YouTube then. I would be. We all say fine. that, yeah. right? We all say that. That's never gonna last. <laughs> <laughs> TikTok. I keep on thinking. You know what? We need a big text TikTok, and then every I'm like, man, I don't want to get into that, and then avoid that one like the plague. Yeah. <laughs> Leave that up to drunk soccer moms. Yeah, I'm, I'm not a 14 year old girl. Yeah. I'm not on TikTok. No. Mm -hmm. Silly. Just do reels. It's better. <laughs> So I even get on Instagram. I'm on Facebook. I know, right? You pay other people to do it for yeah. you. Yeah. It <laughs> yeah. be nice to have that job. Yeah. Just be on the internet all day. It's kind of good. Yeah. It gets old. It gets old. Yeah. <laughs> I like. I mean, we, we started this podcast just so we could do this. I mean, literally. Because you, you came by the shop that one day yeah. and, and hung out with us. We stood there in the, the warehouse for, what, an hour and a half? Yeah. Talking guns and gear and, and bullshitting. And it wasn't lost time. Yeah. But it definitely wasn't. We could be sharing it's, it's, this. It's, with yeah, the yeah. It's, it's not a, a good yeah. use of the time, so yeah. to speak. Yeah, that shop is awesome. Like that warehouse is like a candy dream store. <laughs> Appreciate You're like, it. I just want to roll through like like the old days at Eagle with a, like a big utility cart, like laundry <laughs> bin from the hotel. Like I'll take twelve of these, a dozen of these naked lady golf tees. Like <laughs> like right. yeah, constant. Like that's awesome. Yeah, it's yeah. good. It's good time. We need a shopping cart. Yeah, just for just. Oh, for, we should but, totally get a shopping cart. Yeah, we'll cart. get a, we'll get one. An H E B one. Put the B T O. <laughs> Not that we would do that. Not that we would do that at all. Right? For Maybe. legal reasons, that was a joke. That was totally a joke. 
Steve, what do you've got coming up? What you're working on? This is this is kind of like the the downswing on the backside of the schedule. It's good. I've got about four courses after this. It's literally here, Oklahoma, Florida, Georgia, Utah. Um, you know, quick stop in Georgia for some consulting stuff, and then it's all the way back cross country. Get home, wrap up for the winter, throw everything in the middle of the basement, you know, in the armory, and just like don't touch it for two, three months and go deer hunt and get in the woods and relax. Like, just chill, you know, just... Just go murder some stuff. Well, yeah. You're, you're yeah. so far up north, once it starts snowing, you're you're there. It's great. That's the <laughs> best part, like, yes. man. It's snow, that's why... I'm trying to go further north. I'm trying to get even further north, like almost Canada, if you if you, if you if if they'd let me at this point. Like, an island would be great. But no, it's, uh, it's just the downswing, right? But even in the downtime, there's work to do, right? It's either the consulting stuff, product development stuff. You're always working on that. You're catching up on all the paperwork from the past four months that you've been on the road or whatever it is. And then you're like, oh, God, SHOT Show's here. Why do we still do SHOT Show in this industry? Oh, I know, to hang out, see our friends, and drink, and that's yeah. about <laughs> it. And, and waste a lot of money, and that's the only reason why SHOT Show still exists, because it's tradition. Let, let's be real. It's not a needed event anymore. But So we'll end up there. I think we'll bypass proof that. <clears throat> yeah, last year, even a year prior. You know, nobody suffered. I mean, nobody really. Last did. year was awesome. That's what I heard. I, I, didn't, I didn't go. I stayed back. I relaxed. I'm like, yeah. Well, it was so nice. <laughs> it was so good. You could get you down the aisles. Not the little here. carts hitting you every time. Yeah. yeah. And then after that, it's uh, it, it's just, you know, kicking right after SHOT Show. It's just on the schedule, heavy all the way through to like June time frame. And then that's it. Can you talk about your blaster yet? Is that? What, what gun? Okay. <laughs> not yet. The, 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 yeah, the rumors are there, and it's not going to be a Sons of Liberty gun work shotgun, um, like the internet has been asking for. <laughs> <laughs> I hadn't heard that. that. Oh, yeah, it was a good one. <laughs> that is awesome. And it's like, so we're going to have a Sons of Liberty, like, vein comp shotgun? I'm like, no, unless... <laughs> Maybe, <laughs> but no, no. Uh, yeah, we are. I'm, I am going to get a gun on the line, just like you know most of the other guys. I'm going to do something a little bit completely different than everybody else. That carry handle guns are coming back with quad rails, definitely, um, but not that. <laughs> but yeah, there there will be one coming. God knows when. I, I suspect sometime, you know, by Q2, we'll probably have some. Cool. Nice. It's going to be awesome. I'm I'm excited about it. Yeah, we are too. We are too. And we should be. It's great. What you got coming up? Oh, I'm super busy until right, right up until Christmas, uh, May, May, June, uh, or April, May, excuse me, April, May, and October, November are by far my my biggest uh, months. Um, so I'm I'm uh, I'm on the road nonstop until then, and then I might be squeezing a class in before shot. Uh, but norm normally for me things don't pick up until around March, and that's that's not by my decision. It's just how the hosts you know fall out. But I've still got plenty of whiteboard space for 2023. Uh, if hosts are interested in having me come out, um, hit up my daughter at, at info at presscheckconsulting.com, and uh, and she'll get she'll get you vetted and plugged in. Uh, doing cqb next year i mean i've always done cqb but it's not been like a, a regular advertised deal it's been by by invite uh kind of closed stuff and that's not f because of any opsec or anything like that it's just the way that it way that it falls out but i'm gonna be doing uh a shoot house uh like safety officer class which is basically cqb 101 but then being able to go back and see how the sausage is made. So it'll be student, student graded with me mentoring them, uh, other students, and, and uh, but with a focus on how to cock a house properly, like target placement to meet training objectives, uh, safety protocols to prevent injury or uh, from building bad habits. So training UTM like you would train live so that uh, you're not encouraging bad habits in guys like dumb things like putting targets in front of non-ballistic doors when you're shooting on paint. It doesn't matter when you're shooting on paint, but you smoke through a piece of cardboard and then through a hollow core door in a ballistic shoot house, and that's a bad day. So that's a improperly placed target. So just kind of deep diving um, how to how to, how to to mentor guys in a, in a shoot house. Where are you teaching that at? It'll be at Blue Force Gear, and then okay. if I can get some, uh, if I can get some spot, uh, places in Alliance that I'm probably looking at doing a, a latter part of next year Alliance. Uh, one of those. As we well. need to go to that. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. So that it, sounds it's, good. it's cool. And, and there's an ulterior motive. I came, I came from a culture where you needed a one to one ratio. Um, 
and that's not a cost effective business model i just can't i can't uh the industry will not support four guys with a resume uh similar to mine day rate uh it becomes too cost prohibitive so mo most places are running it with two guys um and i i at a fundamental level I, it's there's so much going on in the room you can do it but it's kind of like the movie man on fire when denzel's talking about being drunk and stuff and he goes well the the, the uh, performance is commensurate with the pay meaning like i'm operating at a diminished capacity but you're not paying me great anyway so you get what you get and that, that's not the product that i want to deliver so by encouraging a train the trainer mindset i can still keep my one-to-one -one student to instructor ratio but i'm i'm enlisting two of the students to fill in on the gap so me and one other guy with two students are still giving four individual aars at the end of the run and so um that that's that's how i've reconciled this it's been something that i've dealt with for the five years now like i want to do this but nobody's going to pay for me to do it right and i don't want to do it wrong yeah and so that's that's kind of been the conundrum that i've been in but we're going to see if we can break that paradigm next year Sounds like a awesome. very interesting class. Yeah. yeah. And and Steve, people can find you at? Uh, SentinelConcepts.com, Facebook, Instagram, the usual places, you know, around the web and yeah, wherever else. All right. Well, awesome. really, really appreciate y'all sitting down. It's awesome, man. I just appreciate it. And for those viewers and listeners out there in Facebook, well, actually, we're not live on Facebook. For those viewers and listeners on YouTube and <laughs> your favorite podcast app, please hit the bell, like, and subscribe. Do the damn thing. Rate us. You can leave a one-star review if you absolutely have to, but Chuck and Steve might hunt you down. So, <laughs> thanks. You're such a shill. <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate it.